So we memorize scripture because why? Why do we memorize scripture? Why do we push? Just throw it out there. It's a tool. Good. Someone else. It's a defense mechanism. Anyone else? Why do we memorize? Come on, Carlos, why do we memorize? There you go. You read my notes? <laughs> to study and show thyself to prove. He's on to something there. It's interesting that he's on to something. We memorize scripture, men, because when Satan attacks, and he will attack, okay, we always don't have our Bible out ready to go, right? We rarely do, just to be honest, just to be honest, right? We're either driving down the road or we're at the kitchen table with our wife and things aren't going well or the boss this or finances that or retirement this or adult children. There's always stuff going on and Satan's wanting to throw these daggers at us. And it's like, well, what's our defense mechanism? How are we to defend? How did Jesus defend himself when he was tempted with Satan, when Satan told him to do certain things? What did Jesus go to? The word, okay? Jesus started quoting things that he has said and it helped. So it's like, okay, well, if this helped Jesus, then why won't we clowns here in 2022 in Chandler, Arizona, why don't we do the same thing? So we push for scripture memorization and we have always chosen a verse that we have tackled for the season, and we're about ready to launch the uh, next verse, which is going to be in Timothy. But let me give you the context of First and Second Timothy before we get into the verse that was selected. So First uh, and Second Timothy was written by Timothy, right? Right? Uh, I heard a couple rights. I'm going to get into that. First and Second Timothy was written by Paul. This is kind of like a pastoral letter. Paul is talking to a younger brother, Timothy, and he's saying, Tim, you need to keep going. I'm about ready to die, and you're about ready to take the mantle of teaching and preaching and, and explaining you need to preserve the gospel. Tim, it's your responsibility to continue what you've learned. Tim, you need to be ready in season and out of season. Tim, it's coming at you. Tim, you better be ready. That's the whole breakdown of First and Second Timothy. Paul is, is laser focused on his younger brother. And he's basically saying, listen, suffering is going to come when you teach the Bible. Men, do you guys understand that suffering's coming for us? Now, we don't know what that looks like. A lot of people like to speculate what the type of suffering that's going to happen being a Jesus follower. But if you just pay a little bit of attention to the news and you see what's going on as it pertains to biblical evangelical, evangelical Christianity, men, it is coming. It is coming. And if you stand up and say, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, I love him, I'm pursuing him, I am following him, I'm not just a believer in Jesus, right? Because the demons believed. Okay, the demons didn't follow. That's why I'm quick to say, guys, we're following Jesus. We're not just going to believe in him. Yes, we have to believe in him. We're going to follow him because it is coming at us. And you guys got to be ready. And this is why we practice. It's like, okay, when we leave those doors and you start your job on Monday morning or your midweek, whatever it is, guys, it is coming. It is coming to where there will be some type of suffering, some type of persecution as it pertains to, oh, so you're a Christian, huh? So you're one of those? You're one of those guys, huh? Okay. Then all of a sudden, maybe your job's going to be on the line. Maybe, maybe there's a family member that you love, maybe an older uncle, maybe a nephew or a niece that's going to be like, hey, Uncle Scott, so really, you're, you're against transgenderism? You're against abortion? And you're going to stand up and say, yeah, I am. They're going to be like, oh, man, we, we got to. It, it could happen. That's, that's real, right? That's going to happen where family, friends, neighbors, society, it's happening. Paul was telling Timothy to guard your heart. There are false teachers out there, Tim, and you need to be ready. So we take the context of First and Second Timothy being that, man, we live in an anti-Christian world. We better be ready because the, the truth is being suppressed. The truth is being suppressed in our culture, in our, in, in our world. I'm going to do a deep dive into that next week because next week I'm starting Romans 1. And I'm going to teach on Romans 1, and there's a section in there where it talks about how the truth is being suppressed. And Paul was telling Timothy, warning Timothy, that he better be ready. He better be ready. So now we get into 2 Timothy 2. So I'm getting a little bit closer to what verse it's, we're going to be 
Uh, but in 2 Timothy 2, if you have your app or your Bible and you want to follow along, I'm going to go skip down a couple of verses before we get to the verse that we're going to memorize. And, and Paul, again, is, is telling him, Tim, you got to be strong. You, you, the things you've heard and you've witnessed in me, you need to teach others. You need to share the gospel. You need to, in verse four, if you're looking at 2 Timothy 2, verse, verse four, Paul is saying, Tim, don't get tangled up and don't get distracted. Okay, men, we get tangled up and we get distracted often. Okay, it just happens. We are pulled in so many different directions. This is, this is another reason why we meet at seven o'clock, because I still want you to have a full day to where you can be with your, your family and your kids. But we, we meet early because we, we're pulled in so many different directions. There's a lot of stuff on our plate. I'm sure right now you're listing the things that you got going on in your mind. Okay, I got to get this done. I got to do that. I got to do this. There's church tonight. I'm volunteering. We are pulled in so many different directions. There are so many distractions, men. We have to be focused. And that's what Paul is saying. He, he, the word focused, at least in my version, is talked about often. He says, don't get distracted and tangled up in stupid arguments with things that don't matter. In verse 4, he talks about a soldier doesn't get distracted. The soldier is focused. Verse 5, he talks about an athlete. An athlete uh, gives effort and determination uh, in order to be successful in whatever sport he's in. That athlete, men, is focused. Then he goes to verse 6. He's talking about a farmer, a farmer who works long hours in a backbreaking effort, right, who is focused to make sure his field is has straight rows and it's going to yield a good crop. Then you jump down between verses uh, 8 and verse 13. Uh, and, and Paul is saying, Tim, it is all about the gospel. Men, practice is all about the gospel. Now, sometimes if you're new to the faith, you're just like, okay, I've heard the word gospel. What, what is the gospel? If you're going to catch anything I say today, it's this. The gospel is man is lost and we are jacked up. We are I'm talking your mom, I'm talking your aunt, I'm talking Mother Teresa, I'm talking the Pope, all. If you look up all in Greek, what does it mean? There you go. Man, you guys are sharp. You guys are sharp. Everybody has a sinful heart. That's why I say your, your aunt, that aunt that is just precious, your mom, your dad, me, you, we're all messed up. The gospel is we are decrepit, we are lost, we need a savior. Jesus came down from heaven, lived on this earth for 33 years, died for you and for me, mainly me, right? And he paid the penalty for my sin. He paid the penalty for your sin. The gospel is man is jacked up and we are bound and we deserve the pit of hell. Jesus came, died for you and me, rose again on the third day that we may have a savior. We may accept him into our heart and live for him. Now that's a choice. That's a choice to accept Christ and to make him king of our life. So when I say the gospel, when in verses eight through 13 there, when Paul's talking about Tim, it's all about the gospel. Okay. That's what we're talking about is that we're messed up. Our savior came. He, he lived for us. He died for us and he's waiting for us in heaven. That's the gospel. Then we get to 14 and 14. Again, he reminds them of these things that we need to be reminded that this is not a debate club. This is not where we come together and say, well, what do you think this verse means? And well, what are your thoughts? It's like, no, what does the Bible say? And then how do we interpret that? Because this book right here, men, is our authority. This is our playbook. This is our play. This is what we go by every Saturday. Then we get to 15. If you haven't figured it out now, uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 is, is going to be our verse. And, and, and the, the, the Bible is so powerful, men. The, the Bible will speak to every area of your life. Um, and it is, it is what we use when, when we're tempted. And so, men, we have to go to the verse. I, I put here in my notes, men, just thinking about God or listening to Caleb or, or reading a 22-second devotional, right? That's not going to work. Okay, that may work for the 22 seconds. But men, you got to get plugged into God's word. You have to open it up. And then you say, well, wait a minute, Bobby. I don't even know where to start. I don't, I don't, know, where to, I don't, I don't know where to read. I, this book is so big, I don't know where to go. I'm going to call your bluff because that's the lame excuse I used to give. 
every Saturday we'll open God's word and we're going to unpack something. So here's here here you go guys, start there. Okay? Your pastor, if you go to a good Bible believing church every Saturday, a Saturday, every Saturday or Sunday, they should be opening up God's word right to a passage. Why don't you start there on Tuesday or Thursday? Start where you're a little bit familiar. So I'm going to break down 2 Timothy 2:15 because that's that's our verse. But you know, earlier, I don't know, I was talking about what's your next step? What's your next step in your life with Christ? Maybe it's scripture reading. Maybe it's like, you know what? I'm going to put my phone down. And I purposely say that because people are like, well, I got my phone on my app. Well, if I call you, if you're reading 2 Timothy 2.15, is 2 Timothy 2.15 going to stay on your phone? Or is my face or my number going to pop up? Or how about a text from somebody else? Or how about a, a, a news update? Something happens, right? It's going to pop up. When you pull out this old book or a book, Okay, are there pop-ups? There's not. So I encourage you men to do it old school and put the phone in the other room, open up your Bible, and, and, and apply yourself. All right, that's my little plug for that. Let, let's get into our verse here. So 2 Timothy 2.15, we have cards for you. We're going to pass those out in a little bit. But let's break down this verse. Let's say it together as a group real quick. Here we go. 2 Timothy 2.15. Okay, everyone, here we go. Ready? Here we go. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker. Okay. There you go. Second Timothy 2.15. Let's break down, yes, ESV or whatever version you have. Okay. So as I was studying this verse, do your best to present yourself. I came across... I think it's seven different versions. So whatever version you have in your Bible, there is, and I think we have them here on the screen. Do we have them, Jim, where it says, work hard to present yourself? Another version is study to show thyself, which is what I like. The third one I have is make every effort to show yourself. Be diligent to show yourself. Do your best to show yourself. Okay, do you guys see a theme? Be eager to show yourself or earnestly seek to demonstrate yourself. Look at all those different ways 2 Timothy 2.15 is telling me and you what we need to do as it pertains to reading the, reading the Bible. So why we're diligent at work. Well, some of you, I'm looking around. Some of you, you're not diligent at all at work. Sorry, I needed a drink there. Do your best. Be eager. What are we eager to do? You know what you're eager to do? You're eager to update your fantasy football roster. Why? Because that's important to you, right? You care about that. Or you care about the stocks or your investments. You're eager to, to do that. You're eager to get into the news. Are you going to be diligent? Make every effort. Do we make every effort? Come on, man. Let's just call a spade a spade. We don't. Why? Because a lot of times it's not important to us. And this is why I just push you as your coach, as your leader. Men, we got to work hard. As a little boy, we were New King or King James Version only church, and it was study to show thyself. We need to study God's word, men. We need to get into God's word and study it. So that's why this verse is very clear saying, do your best. Paul is telling Timothy, tell your people, Timothy, to present themselves. Tim, you need to present yourself to be approved. In your notes or on the app, there's a, there's a fill in the blank there. Give blank to present yourself to God. And it is maximum effort, men. Give maximum effort, guys, to present yourself to God, to get into God's word and to study. The word study, okay, is defined as to gain knowledge. Okay, for the most part, we all want to gain knowledge in a lot of different things. If we're doing a hobby, if we're learning something, if we're we're putting together some type of whatever it is, from a transmission on a car you're fixing up to a puzzle to some something you're doing, you give maximum effort to study to gain knowledge. So whatever you're working on, you're right. It it it's it's right, and so we study. And in, in Psalms one nineteen one hundred five, it says, "Your word is a lamp unto my feet." and a light unto my path. Men, this world is dark. We need a lamp for our feet. We need to know where we're going. We don't need to give examples of 
how many times we stumbled across the room and stubbed our toe because it was dark and 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 some colorful words came out of our mouth as we are arriving in pain because we stubbed our toe or you're walking through the forest at night camping and you hit a, a, a root and, and you fall, whatever it is, when we're walking in darkness, it's hard. We're much slower and we're careful because we don't want to fall. Men, that same analogy applies for where we're at with this world. We're in a dark world. So when it hits the fan and, and, and you stub, stub your toe with work, with children, with finances, whatever, it's, it's a dark world. What, what's our lamp for our feet and a light for our path? It's it's God's it's God's word. All right, Paul says pretty much work two times in in this opening in in this opening sense or this these first couple words where he says present yourself that's work as an approved uh, to God to be approved worker one who does not need to be ashamed rightly handling the word of truth. So Paul is wanted Timothy to understand that to be a a workman of God, that God could approve, we need to be diligent in serving God. We need to be diligent, and and by studying God's Word, it will will affect us. There's a verse, I think we have a slide for Isaiah 53, 6, and if you're taking notes, you may want to jot that down. Isaiah 53, 6 talks about all we like sheep. We are sheep, men, uh, we have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid him on, on him the iniquity of us all. We are sheep. Sheep get distracted. Sheep aren't that bright. Sheep uh, wander off. Sheep drift. Okay? Men, we drift. I drift. You drift. Maybe you don't drift as much as you do now in your walk with Christ, but If your walk with Christ is new, it's going to be easy to drift like a sheep would. Then you get Matthew 5.16. Here's our instructions, man. We need our light to shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's basically right there, man. If you want to uh, put a a, a thought over Matthew 5.16, that is we have a responsibility. Does that make sense? Man, we're responsible. We're responsible with the things we say. We're responsible when someone cuts us off and we want to show them our tall finger. We're responsible for our, to have self-control. We are responsible to our wife, to our children, to our neighbors, to our coworkers, to our family. We have a responsibility. And this is what we push as, as, as your coach, as your leader. It's like, men, I need you to keep me responsible and I'm going to push you for you to be responsible. Like, let's go. Come on, men, we got to do this. We need to be responsible. We need to be a light to shine before men. So anyway, so we, we just, we keep going. And so the more we study, the, the more Christ-like we are, okay? When, when you apply yourself, when, when you apply yourself. And so now you get to the back half of the verse where it says, we need to be a worker, need not to be ashamed, to rightly handle the word of truth. Some versions say to rightly divide the word of truth. When you handle something, so I know a bunch of you guys, as I look back at Bill McCants and I look at some other guys, I know you're packing, which is good. We love our state, right, where you can pack. When you have a handgun, right, well, you hand, Chris, you handle that correctly, right? We handle it correctly. Even when you're, if, if you're teaching your, your son or your daughter how to handle a handgun, right, you're teaching them what's the first thing that we teach children when they have a handgun is what? Safety. So you're showing them safety. You never do this. You never do that. We're handling a handgun or even a sword. We're handling it skillfully. We're handling it right. Why why are we handling it right? We're handling it right to avoid danger. We're handling a handgun right so it's it's used properly. A farmer is plowing a field and and handling the, the ox correctly back in the day or the the tractor correctly, so the rows are right, right? A farmer is handling his equipment correctly. A carpenter, a carpenter, they measure how many times and cut how many times? Measure twice and cut once. I, I, I have, all right, what was it? What was it? Tell me. It was so funny. What'd you say, Mark? Come on. The guys want to know. The guys on, I always get backwards. I always get it backwards. A carpenter measures twice and cuts once, except for Mark. Why? 
Why? Because when they're building something, they want it to they want it done correctly. So when we handle God's word, men, we got to handle it correctly. If I came up here and said Jesus had relations with Mary Magdalene, and it's really not documented, but Jesus and Mary Magdalene went off and they, you know, I better have all of you say, whoa, 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 that's not correct, right? We got to know the truth. If I say money is the root of evil, that's not correct either, right? It says money is a root. And a lot of people, oh, the love of money. See, there you go. Exactly. Exactly. Don't wave your finger at me. Come on. You can though, Lee. It's all good. So again, that's my point is that when something is said incorrectly, and we have a lot of Mormon neighbors, right? And their 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 doctrine is off. I have no problem saying that. We have Jehovah Witness neighbors, their doctrine is off. But when you talk with them, it sounds very similar if you don't know what you're talking about. And so how do we handle the word of truth? We got to rightly divide it, men. We got to rightly divide it like we're dealing with a handgun, like a farmer, like a carpenter. This is why we are going to present ourselves to, to dig into the word, men. You got to do this. All right, we're almost done here with this first section. Okay, then I may have, I may have gone off a little bit. I, I put here, we all seek approval. What's that? <laughs> Did I miss something else? Okay. We all seek approval. Okay. Now, some of you are thinking, no, I don't. I could care less about anybody. There was a time in your life you wanted approval from your boss. You wanted to be approved by your girlfriend, who eventually you married, maybe, or girlfriends, right? You wanted, you wanted to be approved by this chick you were dating because you wanted to marry her. You wanted to get the job. You wanted to impress your boss as he walked around. We, we want to we be approved by our friends and family and our children, especially our adult children. We want them to be approved of us. And so in your, in your note there, notes there, one of the last, I think the last notes I have here is uh, blank blank will be shaped by the word of God. And it is unashamed workmen, men will be shaped by the word of God. Unashamed workmen, men, we, we must be unashamed. This is, this again goes back to talking about, man, it, men, it is coming. We are going to be, we are going to be persecuted. We're going to be ridiculed family may disown us. It, it, it could happen. That is not far-fetched to say there could be someone in your family who says, you know what, I, I've known you forever, and I'm just appalled that this is what you believe. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm now not going to, our relationship is broken. That could happen because taking a stand for Christ. We must be unashamed. That's another thing I'm going to tackle next week in Romans. Romans uh, 116, talking about, oh, Paul says, I'm not ashamed. Men, we, we can't be ashamed. You need to be that 2.0 guy, 2.0 guy that is, you've changed, and the 1.0 version of you is, is now set aside, is now dead, it is now buried. And those 1.0 things you, you, have now, you have now set aside. So we need to rightly handle the word of truth. We must be a light, uh, and God's word must be the anchor for you. Does that make sense? Every boat has to have an anchor. At least it should. And it has to have an anchor. Practice, the anchor for practice is God's word. And we'll never deviate from that. We will always go to it. We're not going to do a study on finances or a study on, on, on marriage or a study on children. Why? Because some guys don't have children. Some guys aren't married. Some, now, there's, there's, there are obviously biblical principles, obviously, to children and, and, and all that stuff. But finances. We're not going to do a, a book from, from Steve Jobs. We're not going to do a book from Bill Gates. We're going to only do this book, and this is going to be our anchor, and, and it is the anchor for men's practice. So if you haven't figured it out yet, 2 Timothy 2.15 is our verse. So uh, we do have cards. I've, I've, I've asked uh, Nacho and Keith and Daryl to pass out cards. Uh, so guys, take these cards. Let's go ahead and pass them out now. Take these cards Put it on the dashboard of your car, your mirror, your computer monitor at work. And, and guys, this is what we're going to study. We're going we're gonna to put um, this Bible verse uh, in the forefront of our minds. And we're going to we're gonna memorize it. Okay. What's that? They need more. 
We have some more if we uh, don't be so tight. We're running out here. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I forgot that. Okay, we good. Second Timothy 2.15. There you go. We need, uh, we need to memorize these. By the way, guys, the old Bible verse is out on the table, which now can be used for invite cards. We also have decals. You don't have to put them on your car, but you can if you want. We have decals sitting on the table out there. If you want a decal of men's practice, training to follow Jesus, this is a good uh, conversation starter for people to be like, what's that about? Um, so take the old Bible verse that's out on there and use that as invite cards. Uh, we also have a sheet that talks about men's practice and, and who we are, what we're doing. Uh, 